On New Year's Eve of 2002, 20 years ago to this day, The Giant Claw, the first of two Walking With Dinosaurs specials, was released. It and the second special, Land of Giants, collectively known internationally as Chased By Dinosaurs, were made by the same creative minds behind Walking With Dinosaurs and Beasts. These specials differ from the previous documentaries by the inclusion of real-life zoologist and wildlife presenter, the time-travelling legend himself, Nigel Marvin. This is the first of several live-action appearances by him in paleontology-based productions by Impossible Pictures. To call him charming would be the understatement of the century. His presenting style has such a sincere enthusiasm to it, you'd need only to watch him for about 20 seconds to see his apparent passion for the natural world, be it real or extinct and computer generated. He is ridiculously likeable. His silly antics and interesting approaches to learning about the animals he comes across in these shows are endlessly entertaining and fun, whilst also being educational. It's a wonderful blend that makes it a truly unique experience. The opening introduces us to the man, the myth, the legend, Nigel himself, with his narration over various clips of the two episodes. It ends with a cool time-travelling warp effect, transitioning into various dinosaurs from Walking With Dinosaurs, before fading to black, with the title being transparent over the opening shots of Nigel in the desert. Not my favourite opening, but cool nonetheless. The Giant Claw is set in late Cretaceous Mongolia 75 million years ago and focuses on unravelling the mystery of the bizarre dinosaur Therizinosaurus. Right off the bat, I really like this approach to storytelling. Having this dinosaur be a mystery to the audience at first is a really effective way of engaging the viewer. Seeing only this enormous claw at first and gradually finding out more and more about the creature over the special's runtime is really cool to see. Granted, if you already know about Therizinosaurus, the mystery element doesn't really work, so your mileage may vary. Nigel refers to this area as the Nemegd Desert, which most likely refers to the Nemegd Formation in modern Mongolia, where most of the creatures in the special were found. I say most, as the region Nigel explores here is kind of a weird conglomerate of the titular Nemegd formation, as well as the slightly older Jadota formation in terms of dates, the environment and its inhabitants. The special is set 75 million years ago, which coincides with age estimates for Jadota, placing it during the Campanian stage of the late Cretaceous but current age estimates put the Nemegd at around 70 million, placing it in the Maastrichtian stage. Aside from being older, the Jadota was also believed to be an arid sandy desert, whereas the younger Nemegd was much wetter with dense forests and water sources. Throughout the special's runtime, the environment transitions from an arid one like that of Jadota to that of the wetter Nemegd, with animals from both formations intermingling. I suppose you could interpret it as this being a time of one formation transitioning into the other, but the dates are still a bit of a stretch. Regardless, after showing us his claw collection, including the titular giant claw of Therizinosaurus, Nigel's tent is wrecked by the first dinosaur we see in the special, the hadrosaur Sorolophus. Now, I don't think it's hard to see that the Sorolophus is a slight retooling of the Anatotitan model from Walking with Dinosaurs, which is itself most likely a retooling of the Iguanodon model, but I digress. That being said, the animals were pretty similar, and 3D modelling is hard, so I don't blame them for reusing assets. The model itself looks a lot nicer than the Anatotitan too, the coloration being a sandy beige with naturalistic patterning and Sorolophus's distinctive small crest on its skull. Unfortunately, it does share the same problem the Anatotitan had in that it retains Iguanodon's distinct thumb spikes that hadrosaurs did not have. Another thing about the front feet is that it's assumed that hadrosaurs had a large hoof covering their weight-bearing digits, as is seen on the Edmontosaurus mummy, Dakota. However, this was discovered years later, so I can't criticise the model for it. Overall, the Sorolophus model is solid for the time. 
Sorolophus was also native to the wetter Nemegd, so it's interesting that they first show it living in the more arid environment typical of Jadota, but it doesn't really matter. Nigel gets a close-up view of it feeding, and we get a great insight of the Hadrosaur's effective method of chewing, as well as Nigel making the greatest noise a human has ever made. <laughs> I really love how the Sorolophus' heads are surrounded by flies. That's a great detail. An interesting note is that Nigel refers to them as the biggest herbivores in the area, which if referring to the Nemegd formation as a whole would be incorrect, as that title would go to one of the titanosaurs that lived at this time and place, not featured in this special. Nemegtosaurus, Opisthocelicordia, or the enigmatic Mongolian Titan, known only from the single largest dinosaur footprint ever found. He could also just be referring to a rough geographic area, which could be true, but I'm just being pedantic. Nigel briefly shows us his guidebook, containing a map of the Earth 75 million years ago, and it looks pretty spot on to me. It's a really cool little detail they didn't need to make as a prop, but I really appreciate its inclusion. Whilst trekking across the desert, Nigel comes across a large nesting colony of Protoceratops, he states that they are nicknamed the Sheep of the Cretaceous because of how common they were. I imagine we see such a huge nesting colony because it's based on the discovery of several dinosaur nests in Mongolia dated to this time, and they were presumed to belong to Protoceratops due to how common its fossils were in the area. These nests also included the famous specimen of Oviraptor that was entombed in sand whilst brooding its own eggs, but was misinterpreted as stealing the eggs of Protoceratops. Several of the nests have now been reinterpreted as belonging to Oviraptorids rather than Protoceratops, however, some nests belonging to Protoceratops have been identified, so it's possible they nested colonially. This is also the first of two genera that are native to the Jadota formation rather than the Nemect. Confusingly though, they are portrayed in the correct sandy environment and time frame of 75 million years ago, but in a place being called the Nemect. As for the actual model itself, it's honestly really good and accurate still to this day. Based on the more rounded shape of the frill, this species seems to be Protoceratops andrews eye, as opposed to the more love heart shaped one of P. Hellenica rhinus. The only small error I can see is that P. Andrew's eye should have a tiny little horn-like structure on its snout, which seems to be absent. We also now know that Protoceratops' frill would have grown exponentially throughout its life, so we should see some variety in the frill sizes, but this was discovered years later. Overall, the Protoceratops model looks wonderful. After Nigel and his probably begrudging crew navigate through the colony by distracting them with a bright red flag, Nigel comes across a forest, the result of the desert's active dune system, which I had never known was a thing until I saw this documentary. This is where the special transitions from the arid environment of Jadota to the more humid one of the Nemegt. It is here that we are introduced to a superstar in the dinosaur world, Velociraptor. Anatomically, it's honestly really accurate, aside from the pronated wrists. However, let's address the elephant in the room, the complete lack of feathers. This is an issue with all dromaeosaurs in the Walking With series, unfortunately. Whilst we don't have any direct evidence of Velociraptor itself having feathers, we do for its close relatives, meaning it is very reasonable to infer that Velociraptor also had feathers. The other glaring issue is that we see them pack hunting a lone protoceratops. This is an extremely common trope in paleomedia, but there is very little evidence that supports pack hunting in dromaeosaurs. They are also shown disemboweling their prey with their signature sickle claws. However, the smooth edges of their claws suggest they would not have been used in this way, and rather would be used for stabbing their prey rather than slicing as is seen here. We do actually have direct evidence of Velociraptor preying upon Protoceratops with the spectacular fighting dinosaurs specimen. It captures a Protoceratops being attacked by, but fighting back against, a Velociraptor by biting down on its arm with its sharp beak, with both animals presumably rapidly buried by a sandstorm or a collapsing sand dune. I believe this is directly referenced by one of the Velociraptors having its arm broken by the Protoceratops. Velociraptor is the second animal native to Jadota, 
So, long story short, Protoceratops and Velociraptor lived together 75 million years ago, but were not contemporaries of any of the other creatures seen in the special. As night falls, we see Nigel collect a scorpion and explains how they are incredibly ancient animals, before stating he plans to take it home with him to the 21st century. Sorry Nigel, but I'm afraid you won't be taking any extinct animals home with you for a few more years. During the night, Nigel's tent is once again disturbed by dinosaur activity, as we are then introduced to Mononychus, a member of the obscure theropods called Alvarezsaurs, and I really appreciate them including the more obscure animals in these shows. Nigel decides to catch one using his bedding. In doing this, he shows us their distinctive single-clawed forelimbs, as well as its feathers. The feathers are accurately shown to be simple, hair-like filamentous feathers, which is wonderful for the time. Much like the Velociraptor, it's anatomically perfect. The biggest issue is just the lack of feathers, as they're too scantily covering the body. Unfortunately, the animal is shown to be far too big for Mononychus, but overall, the model is pretty good. The Mononychus do get revenge on Nigel though by eating his scorpion, which is actually accurate as they were believed to have fed on small arthropods. Sorry Nigel. The next morning, Nigel leaves the forest to search for scrubbier habitat and discovers a Therizinosaurus nest. Nigel states that fossils have been found of monitor lizards here and speculates that similarly to modern monitors raiding crocodile nests, a similar event has occurred with the Therizinosaurus nest. Whilst it's entirely possible extinct monitor lizards raided the nests of dinosaurs, the fossils he's referring to are only known from Jadota. So, unless Varanoid lizard fossils are discovered from Nemeg, Therizinosaur nests are safe. Still, points for incorporating plausible ecological events. Upon investigating the nest site further, Nigel finds an almost complete skeleton of a Therizinosaurus embryo still in its eggshell. They cleverly leave off the skull to keep up the mystery of the giant claw's true nature. This is further compounded by the herbivore dung he finds around the nest. It's probably about time I point out that throughout the special, there is often a type of pterosaur flying around in some shots that, whilst going unnamed in the program, is referred to as the genus Asdarko in supplementary material. If it is indeed Asdarko, then it is by far the most problematic creature of the bunch. Whilst all the other creatures are a mix of Nemegd and Jadota residents, they are all from Campanian to Maastrichtian Age Mongolia, as Darko is known from the Turonian Age of Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, roughly 92 million years ago. Wrong place, wrong time, and on top of all that, it's not really that accurate either. It shares similar problems to other pterosaurs in walking with. The outdated, pointed wingtips that should be rounder, and a complete lack of pycnofibers. It almost looks like they took the Quetzalcoatlus from Death of a Dynasty, shrunk down the head and called it a day. It is possible it is instead meant to represent an as yet unnamed Asdarkid pterosaur from Nemegd, and just slap the name Asdarko on it for the sake of it. But even still, it doesn't match our current understanding of Asdarkid anatomy, especially in terms of the head crest, which looks much more like that of a Tyrannodontid. It was also really hard to get screenshots of it for this video. Maybe it was for the best that it goes unnamed. Later on, Nigel has a close encounter with the Tyrannosaurid Tarbosaurus. Whilst not quite perfect, it is leaps and bounds better than the Tyrannosaurus from Death of a Dynasty. Its head looks a bit shrink-wrapped, but maybe it's a malnourished individual. It has pronated wrists, whereas like all theropods, they should face inwards rather than downwards. It is lacking lips and feathers, both of which are hot topics for tyrannosaurs right now, so I will withhold any criticism on this front for now. It has a basic grey, but really naturalistic coloration, very reminiscent of the T-Rex in Impossible Pictures' later production, Prehistoric Park, also starring Nigel Marvin. The scene where it nearly finds Nigel in the bushes is pretty tense and fun to watch. Afterwards, Nigel heads to a picturesque freshwater lake where all the animals come to drink, and so decides to wait for Therizinosaurus to come to him. Nigel then finds a skeleton of an adult Therizinosaurus. He reconstructs the impressive forelimb and then shows some puzzling herbivore teeth he found alongside them. 
Yeah, sometimes the mystery element of this special is a bit on the nose and obvious, but it's a minor nitpick. He is then ambushed by a pack of velociraptors who chase him into the forest, but he escapes by climbing onto a tree stump and scaring them off with a bike horn. Fun fact, Nigel actually injured his finger doing this, and it was incorporated into the story as him being bitten by the Mononychus from earlier. Nigel then hears the unmistakable sound of a, quote, terrific kerfuffle back by the lakeside. It is revealed to be Sorolophus making alarm calls due to the arrival of the Tarbosaurus coming to drink. The predator is interrupted, however, by a noise that words cannot properly describe, heralding the arrival of the giant claw itself, Therizinosaurus. I'll be damned, it's honestly still really accurate to this day. Aside from the lack of feathers, which we know other Therizinosaurs did have, we do not know the extent of its feather covering, however. As stated earlier, its fossil claws were originally mistaken for the ribs of a giant turtle, which is referenced in its specific name, Chiloniformis, meaning turtle form. It might look, and also sound, weird, but that's Therizinosaurus for you. It has a classic staple dinosaur colour palette of green and brown, but it looks really nice and believable. So, to my surprise, the Therizinosaurus model holds up shockingly well to this day. It does appear to be larger than the Tarbosaurus when the reverse was actually the case, but it could just be a smaller individual of Tarbosaurus. The two theropods size each other up, Nigel gets a bit too good of a view of the Tarbo's cloaca, and the Therizinosaurus slashes the Tarbo across the face, causing it to back down. The giant claw then reveals its true nature, as several of them emerge from the forest and begin to browse on the trees. Despite seeing the potential damage their claws could cause, Nigel decides to take a page out of Sarah Harding's book and go up and touch one with the theory that his mammalian scent would not alarm the dinosaurs due to Mesozoic mammals being small, unthreatening creatures to them. We then cut to Nigel's shaky cam as the credits roll. The special ends with the giant claw licking the lens of Nigel's camera. As far as I know, their tongues couldn't do that, but it's such a fun moment that I don't even care. I think that sums up the giant claw quite nicely. It's a really fun ride and puts a different spin on the walking with formula. Whilst I do prefer the more traditional style of walking with dinosaurs and beasts, Nigel is such a joy to watch, and I think he adds a unique and wonderful flavour to these paleo docks. I love the filming location of Fraser Island for Lake Cretaceous Mongolia, and the diversity of dinosaurs is really impressive considering it's only half an hour, and most of the creatures have wholly original models, all of which are beautifully textured and animated as to be expected of frame store. Story-wise, the mystery is compelling to see on Ravel too. Even if it is a bit too obvious and on the nose at times, it's well paced, well written, and despite some accuracy hiccups here and there, on the whole, it stood the test of time pretty damn well if I say so myself. I really enjoyed the giant claw, and I'm looking forward to revisiting the second Chase by Dinosaurs episode, Land of Giants, next time. Thank you so much for watching, bye bye now.